Let's pray. Father, this story that we are about to open is one of the greatest stories in the Bible. It is so full of hope for people who can't make any sense out of the troubles they're in. It is so full of Christ and his ways with us. And so I pray for help to be faithful to this inspired biblical story and I pray for the experience of it in my own life and I pray for everyone in the hearing of my voice that we would learn about Jesus here and learn about how to live under the perplexing providences of life. So draw near now and be our teacher. And if there is any here or downtown campus or north campus who are without Christ watching this, listening to this, I pray that there would be a powerful movement of your Holy Spirit to awaken dead hearts to experience spiritual reality. See Christ for who he is, embrace him, trust him, and be rescued from the wrath of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Before we retell the story now of Joseph, and the spectacular sin of his brothers and its global purpose in the glory of Christ, we need to back up to Genesis chapter 12. God chose Abram from all the peoples of the world freely, by grace, not owing to anything in Abram, to make his own people. Genesis 12, 2 and 3 He makes a promise to Abram, I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So there is the beginning of the people of Israel through whom would come Jesus Christ, the Son of God to save us from our sins. Chapter 15 has something very unusual in it. It's an unusual act and it's unusual words. In Genesis 15, 13 to 16, God makes a formal covenant with Abraham. He cuts some animals in half, tells him to walk through the animals in the dark as darkness settles. And then he says something absolutely stunning. Genesis 15, 13. Know for a certain, Abram, that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. Verse 15. And they will come back here in the fourth generation. 16. They will come back here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. That is a strange way to begin a covenant relationship with your people. One of the very first things he says to his chosen people is, first we begin with 400 years of affliction. (laughs) Four hundred years. Let it sink in. America has been here, what, 230 some years?
they will be afflicted 400 years. That's what it says. They're not going to inherit the promised land now. That's for later. Why? There are many reasons. One is mentioned here. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. (laughs) It's going to take 400 years for enough sin to accumulate among the Canaanite peoples so that when Joshua does his brutal massacres, it will make sense. Just takes your breath away. Deuteronomy 9 verse 5 says this about why the peoples of Canaan are destroyed by Joshua. It says, not because of your righteousness, Joshua and the Israelites, not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you that he may confirm the word of the Lord that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The conquest of Canaan by Joshua 400 years later is a judgment from God on the Canaanite peoples because their sins are now full. We'll stop for a little application. This is not the main point of the sermon. In view of how God begins his relationship with his covenant people, starting with 400 years of affliction, does it surprise you that when Paul was returning on his first missionary journey from Iconium to Lystra to Derby and doing a little basic discipleship with these brand new Christians, Luke says the one thing he said, there are other things, I'm sure, but Luke only mentions one thing in Acts 14, 22. He told them all, through many tribulations, you must enter the kingdom of God. That's the first and only thing Luke mentions that you should say to a new believer. So anybody discipling a new believer, make sure one of the first things you say is, through many tribulations, through Egypt, you get to the promised land. No detours. 400 years if you're a people, 60 or 80 if you're a human being. Not surprising to me, it's all over the Bible. So here's the question in this series of sermons. We could do so much with this story. I have one question. I'm asking all these spectacular sins. How did this prophecy get fulfilled? The people, now this is Abraham. This isn't Isaac. This isn't Jacob. This isn't Joseph. This is Abraham being told, your descendants are going to spend 400 years of affliction in Egypt. How does it come about? That's what I'm asking. How does it come about? And the answer is, It comes about through a spectacular sin. A sin that sets up things so that the chosen people are rescued from starvation and the tribe of Judah is prevented from being extinguished so that the lion of Judah would come. That's the point of the sermon. Huge things are at stake in the story of Joseph. 
It's not a little, it's not a little lesson only for how to cope with hard providences. It is that. It's wonderfully that. But oh, so much more. So let's go back to Abram and bring it up to, to Joseph. Abram has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons who become the 12 patriarchs or the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph is one of those, and he has two dreams. Both of the dreams picture his 11 brothers bowing down to him, symbolically, stars and sheaves. In one of them, his mother and father are bowing down to him. And chapter 37, verse 8 says, his brothers hated him for these dreams. And verse 11 says, they were jealous of him. Hatred and jealousy often go together. And then the day came for them to vent their rage on this brother. His dad sends him out to see how they're doing in their shepherding, and they see him coming. And they say in verse 19 of Genesis 37, here comes this dreamer. Come now. Let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what becomes of his dreams. Reuben, the oldest son, who's going to have to give an account for the boy, tries to save his life, and he partially succeeds. When they come back, when he comes back, Having thrown him in a pit, he finds no one in the pit. They've sold him into slavery to the Ishmaelites, the Midianites, and he's on his way to Egypt for the next 22 years before they ever see him again. Reuben is at his wit's end. The brothers soak his coat in animal blood, take it to his dad and tell him, this is what we found, and his father concludes he's been eaten by an animal. These brothers have no idea what is going on here. <laughs> they don't have a clue what they are doing. They think they are about to destroy the dreams. And in fact, they are fulfilling the dreams. This is a great story. You've got to feel the wonder of this story. God does this so often. This is not an exceptional story. This is a typical biblical story. This is the way it happens over and over again. God takes the very sins of the destroyers and makes them the means of their salvation. Unbelievable the way God turns things on their head over and over again. Job, Esther, Joseph, Jesus. It's all over the Bible. He does it this way. Joseph is in Egypt. He's sold to Potiphar. Potiphar is a big guy in Pharaoh's court, the commander of the guard. And Joseph also doesn't have a clue what is going on. I have been sold into slavery, and I'm in a foreign country, and I know God, and I don't understand a thing that's happening to me. And so, he is so wonderfully exemplary, he just begins to serve Potiphar faithfully. What would you do? What would you do? Sit down and grumble and grumble and grumble against God. That's not what Joseph did. He just said, here I am, I will be a faithful follower of my God, and I will serve Potiphar as 
well as I can, and he rises in Potiphar's trust. Potiphar puts his whole household in his charge, and you think that righteousness is being rewarded. Potiphar's wife thinks he's quite a beautiful young man and seduces him. In love for his master and his God, he just does exactly what Paul says he should do. He flees fornication and adultery. Do you ever get in one of those situations? Just leave your coat and run. A woman who has been run from like that is not a happy camper. She is vicious. And she lies. She says he was the one who was doing the seducing and Potiphar, who had trusted him, throws him into jail. And that's what you get for your righteousness, Joseph. Ever been... Ever get the wrong thing for doing the right thing? Join the biblical club. In prison, again, totally unaware of what's going on. He doesn't know anything about what God's up to. It makes no sense, just like many of your lives right now. You look at the circumstances, it makes no sense. But he trusts God, and he serves the jailer, does everything he's told, and is a righteous man. And the jailer trusts him, puts the jail in his charge. And then these, this butler and this baker come and he tells their dreams and they come true. And the butler is put back in his cut-bearing position and Joseph says, advocate for me, I help you. And he's forgotten for two more years. He's just forgotten. That's what you get for being a faithful divine interpreter of dreams. You just get forgotten two years. And then the meanings are getting close. The cupbearer remembers. Joseph is called up by Pharaoh to interpret his dream. He nails the dream by God's help. Seven plentiful years, seven lean years. And here's what you should do to cope with the lean years. Pharaoh is so impressed with the interpretation and the strategy for coping with the lean years, he makes him his vice president. You shall be over my house, and all my people under them shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne, I will be greater than you. And then the seven years of plenty came, and Joseph wisely stored away grain. And then the seven years of famine came and his brothers got hungry. And they hear that there's food in Egypt. And so they go to Egypt. Collapsing the story that gets drawn out in the Bible in a most tantalizing way, after 22 years, they can't recognize him, but he recognizes them, and the point comes where he tells them, I'm Joseph. You sold me into slavery, and here I am, the vice president of Egypt, saving your life. And I do mean to save your life. They're stunned. And they're afraid. They tried to get rid of the dreamer. And in getting rid of the dreamer, fulfilled the dreams. You cannot resist God's ultimate purposes. Eventually, he lets them live in Egypt to save their lives. 
and the fulfillment of the distant prophecy of Abraham that his seed would spend 400 years in Egypt begins to be fulfilled through a spectacular sin. So we ask again, how did God's people wind up in Egypt? In fulfillment of God's plan? What does God want to teach us here about his ways in the world and the strange sojourn in Egypt? And what about Jesus? What's he got to do with all this? Well, the first answer to the question, how did they wind up in Egypt, is through attempted murder, greedy slave dealing, and heartless deceit of a broken-hearted old man. That's how the prophecy got fulfilled. It was a spectacular wickedness. How does the Bible describe it? Two ways. Chapter 45, verse 5. And chapter 50, verse 20, they should be circled in red in your Bible. So you go back to them again and again. These are the two verses that interpret the whole story. 45, 5, 50, 20. Take a pencil and circle these two verses. They are the most important verses almost in the story. I'll tell you the most important ones shortly. So let's take each of them. Genesis 45, 5. Joseph has told his brothers who he is, and they are very afraid. And he says to them, Now, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. So the first way the Bible describes this spectacular sin is that it is God's sending of Joseph to Egypt. The attempted murder, the greedy slave dealing, the heartless deceit of the old man are the sending of God, of a Savior, to prepare hope for the murderers. Now, unless you think that verse 45.5 is kind of marginal, it's the one, it's the one that the psalmist in Psalm 105 picks up on, and he doesn't just say what the verse says, he ups the ante twice fold. I'll read you Psalm 105, verses 16 and 17. It says, telling the history of Israel. When he, God, when God summoned a famine on the land and broke all the supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. So not only does the psalm say that in and through all that spectacular wickedness, God himself was sending a savior, He says, get the thought out of your mind forever that this famine happened by accident or by the devil or by the laws of nature. God didn't look into the future and say, oh my, Satan is going to bring a famine on the land and my people will be endangered. I will now devise a plan to rescue them from Satan's devices. Wrong. Let's just read the verse again. This is Psalm 105, verse 16. When he summoned a famine on the land, and when he broke the supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them. God brought the famine. God planned to bring his people to Egypt this way. That's the first way the Bible talks about it. God sent, God sent Joseph. Here's the second way that the Bible talks about what happened to get his people to Egypt. It's in 50, chapter 50, verses 19 and 20. Now the father is dead, 
and they're really afraid because now it may be that without hurting his father, he'll kill them. That's what a normal human being would do. They would take vengeance. Joseph doesn't seem to be a normal human being. He seems to be signaling something, the kind of person he is. Chapter 50, Joseph says, verse 19, 20, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people would be kept alive as they are today. The prophecy that 400 years would be spent in Egypt is being fulfilled through a spectacular sin. You meant it for evil and the sovereignty of God. God meant it for good. Do not smudge this verse as though it sent, as though it said, you meant it for evil, God used it for good. That is emphatically not what the verse says. The verse says clearly, no big fancy exegetical footwork here. You had a meaning in this sin, and God had a meaning in this sin. And your meaning in this sin was kill this guy and get rid of him and end this dreaming. And God had a meaning in this sin, and it was save the killers through the sufferings of Joseph. Don't rob God of his precious intentionality. It's called L-O-V-E. Now, here's the key big question that's going to draw out the main important verse in the story. What about Jesus? What about the Christ? What about the Messiah, the long hoped for one? See anywhere here? Is, is, is this pointing anywhere are there any analogies here? Are there patterns here that would illuminate Christ for us, make us love Jesus more, see him more? There are, and I'll show you three. Number one, first, there is a general pattern that turns up in the Bible over and over again, namely the pattern that God's saving victory happens through sin and suffering. God's saving victory for his people happens through sin and suffering. That is all over the Bible. It's a pattern. And there's a reason why the pattern is there. So that when the, the pattern came to the planet and did it this way, we wouldn't be so surprised like so many people were when he came. They, they couldn't make any sense of how much sin was being exerted against him and how much suffering he seemed to undergo and this didn't fit their conceptions of Messiah, but it should have because of stories like Joseph, Job, Esther, Isaiah 53, and on and on. It, it should have Jesus did Joseph. Jesus did, did Joseph. He was just Joseph. Betrayed. Sold. So, for those of us who read the whole Bible, we can't help but see a pattern here that is the pattern which when Jesus comes, it just explodes with significance because he is the final fulfillment of this pattern. He did it this way. He saved his killers. 
He's prayed for them from the cross. Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? It's all over Joseph's story. That's number one. Number two, dig in a little more precisely on this pattern. Not only is there a general pattern here that suffering and sin leads to triumphs whereby the very sinners and killers are saved, that, that's the pattern. But notice that Joseph is extraordinarily righteous. Just extraordinarily steadfast covenant-keeping, non-murmuring, quietly taking his suffering, doing everything you would expect a good and righteous man to do. He just stands out as a stunning star in the story. I'm not sure, this is just speculation and who knows, that the first verses of verse 37 are intended to show a priggish, proud, snooty young man boasting about his dreams. I don't hear that. I don't hear that. Maybe I doubt it. Doesn't really affect my point. I just think he's presented as an incredibly good man. I mean, Potiphar served him. Jailer served him. He just was there doing the right thing when there was no apparent reward. Kept getting mistreated. Here's the verse about the jailer. The keeper of the prison, this is Genesis 39, 22. The keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. Amazing. His reward, be forgotten another two years by the cup bearer. Now, when Jesus came into the world to suffer, to be sold, to be so badly sinned against and ultimately to die, he was perfectly righteous. And just like Joseph's righteousness in the short run was totally not rewarded, and Jesus, in the short run, totally not rewarded. Spit, beaten, lacerated, crowned, stabbed. There's your righteousness for you. Just like Joseph. But in the end, vice president of Egypt. And in the end, every tongue will bow. Now, what's the most important verse in the story? That leads me to number three. The third and final portrayal of Christ is not a parallel with Joseph at all. It's a prophecy by Jacob over his son, Judah. Near the end of the story, Jacob is dying, and Jacob begins to bless each of his sons with prophetic blessings. And he blesses his son, Judah, in Genesis 49, verses 8 through 10, these are the most important verses in the story. Genesis 49, verses 8 through 10. Jacob is about to die, and he blesses Judah with these words. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. 
your father's sons shall bow down before you. In other words, Joseph isn't the point of this story. There was another one who will have the brothers bow down. He stooped down. I'm sorry, back up to verse 9. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness who dares rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Now here's a prophecy of a final coming king of Israel, a lion of Judah, a Messiah. Look at verse 10 very carefully. The scepter, the ruler's staff, sign of a king, will be in the line of Judah until someone comes. And what will mark this person? All the peoples will obey him. Not all the people will obey him. This is not a king of Israel alone. This is the king of the universe. All the peoples will obey him. So now listen to John in the book of Revelation. Take up this language for Jesus. This is Revelation 5, 5 and 9 and 10. Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scrolls and its seven seals. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign on earth. And here's the, the beautiful thing about this lion. It just catapults him beyond Joseph, beyond Judah, beyond all human beings and all kings. This lion of Judah will have the obedience of the peoples, but what marks him as unique and distinct and glorious and praiseworthy is that he doesn't take the guilt of the peoples and twist it, crush them down, and demand obedience and coerce it out of their hearts. This this lion takes the guilt of his people and bears it and dies in their place. And thus wipes clean all of the bondage and all of the unrighteousness and all the failures and all the guilt so that now in his perfect righteousness and his perfect sacrifice, we, the peoples, have a security around us from which we can now give free obedience. Why would you not obey such a lion and a lamb who died for you? So Christ is the lion of Judah. The point of the story of Joseph is that God in his sovereignty through a spectacular sin saved the killers and in doing so preserved the household of Judah from which there could then come the lion of Judah who would do the full salvation of all the Christ killers, namely me and you. That's the point of the story of Joseph. He wins the obedience of the peoples, not coercively, but by dying for the peoples, rising again, freeing them from their guilt, triumphing 
over all their fears, making them perfectly secure on the basis of his obedience, not theirs, so that in the circle of Christ, they are totally secure, totally safe, totally happy, out of which they enter the world in obedience to their king. And the only question left for you is, does he have yours? Does he have yours? Have you received the lion and the lamb into your life so that his righteousness counts for you and his sacrifice counts for you and his wrath removal and guilt bearing counts for you? Or are you stiff arming him? We were talking downstairs just a few minutes ago about a work situation where a brother is witnessing and the unbeliever simply said, I don't want God in my life. I like my life the way it is. I'm having a good time. I don't want him to mess with it. Is that you? If it is, you are walking on a precipice that is so dangerous. I plead with you, don't stay there. Let the lion and the lamb have you. It will mean your salvation, your present joy in affliction, and everlasting peace. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are very amazing in the way in the Old Testament you did deliverances and in the New Testament you did the deliverance. And we stand amazed at Joseph and 10,000 times more amazed at Jesus because he suffered so much more and he deserved it so much less and he was righteous so perfectly and he prayed for his enemies, namely us. So we welcome him, we, we receive him. May everyone in the hearing of my voice receive Jesus and then sing with all their heart and can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for